Today's movie stars both John Saxon and Linda Day George. This might be the greatest film ever made. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're tackling Herb Freed's spooky chiller, Beyond Evil. Released in 1980, Beyond Evil is mostly memorable for having Sick Flicks veterans John Saxon and Linda Day George headlining. It's mostly a by the number supernatural ghost story, but can it carve up enough victims to earn a coveted five barf bag rating? Let's get to the gore and find out. Oh, and before we get started, today's video is sponsored by patrons Goth Barbie 3000, Joseph Dark Helmet, and JH. If you'd like to sponsor some videos and help free me from the shackles of YouTube's ridiculously arbitrary monetization policies, you'll find a link to my Patreon in the pinned comment in the description below. The support helps me keep the show running. And now, let's get bloody. We fade in on some credits. Beyond Evil, eh? This movie's clearly so dark that evil is not a strong enough adjective to accurately describe it. And before we get into the credits, we're gonna detour to this Welcome to the Island luau. <laughs> I hope someone roasted a pig. And starring John Saxon. This movie just got a hundred times cooler. And Linda Day George? This is the greatest casting since Saxon and Giovanni Lombardo Radice teamed up for Cannibal Apocalypse. And then detour out of the credits to some stock footage. Stock footage credits. This might be a sick flicks first. Our two young lovebirds run off into the woods for some alone time. Sure hope they don't run into any cannibals out here, or Joe D'Amato making a cannibal movie. Turns out all they find is this big white mansion. House establishing shot. Hope you have your drink ready. Ah, and the credits are still going. With a name like Ken Plotten, you'd think he'd have been a writer and not a DP. Ah, there's a floating head in the house. Oh wait, she's just wearing black. Phew. But wait, she makes this pillar fall right on our young lovebirds. She's gonna be wiping Southpaw for the rest of her days. Eventually, the doc shows up, and I don't know, is he a doctor or a faith healer? Hard to tell by this expression. Fortunately, this guy's rates are pretty reasonable. Looks like it's only gonna cost her an arm and not a leg too. And another house establishing shot. Directed by Herb Freed. A year later, he'd give us graduation day. Things are about to get way more exciting because over at the airport, Saxon and Linda Day George have finally arrived. Um, <laughs> did we just decide to cut the audio here? No furs, no Louis Vuitton. What, what's, what's come over you guys? His mouth is moving, but no words are coming out of it. Man, look at Saxon's outfit. Dude looks like he's about to go on a safari and kill elephants with his bare hands. Also, he's like, baggage claim? No thanks, I already have a wife. Linda has left her bag behind. Rico Suave here is gonna make his move. I'd love to show you around. Perhaps we could get together sometime. Ah, oh, give it up, man. She's with John Saxon. You'd have a better chance of shitting diamonds than stealing Saxon's woman. Meanwhile, Saxon's buddy is clearly not a Linda Day George fan. She's the best thing that ever happened to me. Her? That's nothing. Awkward. They eventually arrive at the hotel, and did Saxon just pet her like a dog? Who's a good puppy? Linda Day George is. I don't know what this dude's deal is, but he's definitely giving off some creepy vibes with his toothy smile and slick Rick starter kit chain. Inside, Linda is not happy. We always manage to accommodate Del Giorgio. Tell us what you really think about Del Giorgio, Linda. Bastard! Bastard! Over in another movie, Rico Suave is meeting with Henry Kissinger. They're probably just talking about foreign policy. From a banking point of view, this loan doesn't make any sense at all. Or finance. And blue filter mid-afternoon house establishing shot. Finish your drink and refill. I think Herb Freed really had to crane his neck up to get this shot. They have a little meeting at the construction site, and man, I wonder what the white pants budget was on this movie. Also, I suddenly want ice cream. I don't know, is this dude a real estate tycoon or king of Studio 54? I mean, the suit says business, but those platform heels say disco stew. Disco stew doesn't advertise. Later that night, they all meet for dinner, and Dell has some bad news. There isn't any apartment. There never was one. Linda Day George voices her displeasure at this development. Bastard! Bastard! But wait, she may have jumped the gun, because he's giving them a house. And if you guessed it's the giant house from earlier, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. But hey, this movie has been pretty busy so far, so let's take a break and watch this guy twirl a fire baton. Ah, padding. This segues to, you guessed it, another blue filter mid-afternoon house establishing shot. May God have mercy on your liver. 
I gotta say, we're not even 20 minutes in. This might break the house establishing shot record if it can keep this pace up. They head inside, and why do I feel like we're about to wander into the opening scenes of Mitchell? I knew it. This house was too good to be true. Of course there's a catch. What he means is the place is supposed to be haunted. And then it's time for some exposition and a flashback. Dear Penthouse Forum, I never thought stories like this happened to guys like me. This lady's drinking like she just saw a house establishing shot. Back in the flashback, we get this great moment in horror film acting. Ah <laughs> yes, very subtle. Anyway, the gist of all this jibber-jabber is that Alma is a witch, and her husband poisoned her. And now she's haunting the place. Let's ask Lance Hendrickson what he thinks of all of this. That's the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I will say it's a bold choice to run this sequence as a slideshow. This is what it looks like when I try to run 4K video on Premiere without a proxy file. And here's the moment where Alma flunked out of chiropractor college. Later that night, Linda Day George wakes up just in time for football practice. Something's creeping around the house. Or I think it's just the cameraman. I gotta say, Christopher George might have been the only man manly enough to let his wife sleep with Saxon without worrying she'd leave him. And it turns out the stalker is Alma. She likes to watch. Hell yeah. No, not like that, you pervs. I mean, she likes to watch them sleep. Damn, that still sounds dirty. The next morning, the Spirit Airlines team delivers John and Linda's luggage with the level of care and professionalism you'd expect. Saxon carries the stuff upstairs, but he's gonna need a life alert bracelet apparently because he's fallen and he can't get up. <laughs> That's not bad enough, the devil then decides to drop in. Literally. This must have been a real shock to Linda because she's looking a little green. Down at the construction site, Rico does his best Terminator impression. But I'll be back. Later. <laughs> definitely needs some work. Saxon heads home and, oh yeah, this is definitely the opening of Mitchell. He's gonna shoot Budget Johnny Mathis, I just know it. And somehow this segues to Saxon eating topless candlelight dinner? I don't even know what is happening here. Later that night, Linda's having a hard time sleeping. I knew that double bean burrito was a bad idea. And she's so sick, she's having flashbacks to earlier flashbacks. You know, just in case you forgot. I mean, it's all very meta. The next morning, Saxon hears words he's never heard from a woman before. I don't feel like being touched right now. Hey, remember the doctor from the start of the movie? Well, he's still in this movie. Why? Your guess is as good as mine at this point. Back in the house, someone's trying to shotgun Linda Day George's shoes. Judging by the height, it's probably Bushwick Bill. Rest in peace, Bushwick. She's really desperate to get out of this movie. Don't do it, Linda. Just call your agent. And hospital establishing shot. Hey, wait a minute, Rico is a doctor? He's probably like Dr. Nick. Hi, everybody! Judging by this code, he's like a doctor of karate or something. On the way out, Linda makes a startling discovery. She's been branded with the Scarlet Letter. Well, that or she got an Atlanta Braves brand. Couldn't go either way. Saxon, meanwhile, is on the phone. Yeah, Herb, could you like get some gore or something into this movie soon? My rugged charisma can only carry the script so far. Back at the crib, Linda goes all straight edge on Saxon when he offers her some wine. <laughs> if this is all too subtle for you, she's turning into Alma. She hits the hay, but she's got company. How many fingers am I holding up, Linda? And she still hasn't tossed that Satan statue. And why would you? I mean, it really ties the room together. Down in the dining room, this table is smoking. And while she's distracted, a jump scare sneaks up behind her. I hope I didn't frighten you. God, Rico, don't you knock? The door was open. Yeah, likely story. And holy shit, and a Fulci eye zoom in a Herb Freed movie. Jesus, Rico just doesn't give up. I thought maybe we might become closer. Guaranteed, this dude has a manifesto somewhere filled with rants about women hating nice guys. Before he leaves, he has some parting words for her. I wouldn't go over there if I were you. That's the crypt. Grizzly place. Oh, that's okay. My husband was in Grizzly. As Rico drives off, you can see the exact moment when his car's extended warranty expired. <laughs> Happens all the time. Yep, should have sprung for the extra coverage. I love that it catches on fire before it actually goes over the cliff. I mean, he's probably okay. I think he had his seatbelt on. Later, Saxon gets the runaround at the hospital and has to serve these orderlies a heap and helping of pimp and. Man, don't make me mess up my toupee. Trying to lay low to avoid an assault and battery charge, Saxon heads over to the healer, aka Budget Jack Elam. Do you kids even remember Jack Elam? Christ, I'm old. He's doing a little psychic surgery, and it seems totally fine that he's not even wearing gloves, right? After that, Saxon's convinced and wants Dr. Jack to make a house call. But he's like, sorry, your insurance doesn't cover in-home health care. And since nothing much is happening, I guess we might as well cut back to dancing native guys. Then the doc offers his best medical advice. 
Leave that place now. But Saxon's like, I haven't even made the first mortgage payment. I can't leave. Not in this real estate market. He heads home and immediately knows something is wrong. Hey, there's no J and B here. He and Linda have a heart to heart, and here's a giant red flag. Let's make a pact. If you're not dating a goth chick and she says, let's make a pact, run. Back at the construction site, things are going down. Like this elevator. They must have Tesla heavy equipment here because this thing is shifting itself. And it's about to drop a load on John Saxon. Hell yeah. No, I mean it's going to drop these steel girders on him. Man, OSHA is going to shut them down for weeks now. Afterwards, Dell says what I've been thinking this whole movie. We're a couple of idiots. Well, I think that about Dell anyway. I mean, no one thinks that about John Saxon. I figured, what the hell, let's indulge Barbie. That's the whole problem right there. You can't give abroad too much. Jesus, I'm guessing there was a really bad divorce in this dude's past. If there's one thing I know, it's women. <laughs> oh, clearly. I mean, how could anyone doubt that now? You're obviously a hit with the ladies. Let's see what Linda Day George thinks of old Dell. Linda, could you describe Dell in one word? Bastard! Back at the house, check out Barbara's sweet spirited away necklace. Well, he's telling her to back off a of Saxon, which is going to be interesting since they're married. Someone messes up the tin in contrast to the movie. Then, in the least believable plot twist ever, she locks lips with Dell. No way she's stepping out on John Saxon. Turns out this was all a setup so we could get this great moment in horror film acting as possessed Linda sends him plummeting to his doom. He really went head over heels for her. You could say he fell for her pretty hard. The next day, Saxon comes home from work early and catches Linda in the act of summoning Satan. You could say she's got the hot hand. And since things were slightly less boring, let's hop over here where our faith healer cleans the wax out of this dude's ear. Then, without ever even having seen Linda Day George, he makes the perfect diagnosis. The spirit of Alma Martin is trying to possess your wife's physical presence. Man, he's like Supernatural House. And since this lady hasn't got much screen time, let's just hold on her for an uncomfortably long period of time for absolutely no reason. Meanwhile, Linda's finger is looking great. Like a brat you left in the microwave for too long. And house establishing shot. <laughs> it's been a while. Inside the house we just established, Alma's about to demonstrate her magical powers when she turns into a still shot and they draw lasers coming out of her eyes? For real? Are you shitting me, Herb Freed? But wait, there's also this masterpiece of effects wizardry. It's like she's flashing her high beams. Anyway, Jack Elam's daughter has a big green thing up her nose and it's actually not a booger. Back at the healer's place, Linda is green with envy. Not gonna lie, I have a very strong, unsettling feeling that nothing is gonna ever happen in this movie. And to prove my point, they just go home and head to bed. Saxon's slumber is interrupted by some strange voices. Honey, are you down here summoning Satan again? We talked about this! And there's like 12 minutes left in this movie, so we might as well kill some time here where Nigel Thornberry's dad finds Dell's remains. I like that he looks like he's heading out on safari as soon as he's done here. Chin up, governor. Before he heads out, he's all like, I must ask you some questions, chap. I don't never get tired of that pun. With the movie rapidly running out of time, thank God, Saxon and Jack Elam decide to blow up the crypt. <laughs> sure, why not? Man, this is just like when he burnt Freddy's bones in Elm Street 3. Only way less cool. I guess, if nothing else, Beyond Evil is at least primed for an explosive finale. And sure, let's get one more blue filter mid-afternoon house establishing shot in there. Good news is they blew up Alma's portal between dimensions. The bad news is now she's stuck in Linda Day George. I mean, it looks like Saxon's marriage is going up in smoke. Don't look now, but Alma's here, and she's brought her Suspiria light kit with her. And it gets worse. You destroyed my Christmas. I am free now. Yeah, good work, guys. Top-notch effort. Now that she's free, she's totally going to use her powers to kick ass, right? Well, if by kicking ass you mean half-heartedly tossing this mask at Saxon and Elam, then yeah, sure. Saxon takes off, but he takes this ghostly chair shot like he's Mick Foley. With things looking bleak, Saxon takes Beyonce's advice and puts a ring on it. And then this happens. It's like she's hulking out. I feel like based on her reaction, she thinks this is an indecent proposal. Almost back, but she's basically dying like the Deadites at the end of Evil Dead. I love the fact that Herb is like, nah, fuck it, we can cram in one more house establishing shot during the climax? See? Totally like the Deadites. All she needs to do is say join us. And with Evil defeated, Saxon and Linda Day George are free to head off in search of better movies to star in. But if you guessed there was time for one last house establishing shot, well, you know my show all too well. So, what have we learned from Beyond Evil? Well, for starters, not even John Saxon and Linda Day George can save this tepid chiller. 
It's wild how little actually happens in this movie and how underwhelming the action is when it does finally make it to the screen. This feels more like some weird domestic drama than a horror film, if we're being honest. I'm glad companies like Vinegar Syndrome preserve these movies on disc, but sometimes movies are lost for a reason. But enough about that. Can Beyond Evil redeem itself on the splatter front? Let's go to the gore card! In terms of gross anatomy, Beyond Evil is very light. We're treated to a car crash, a guy falling off a balcony, multiple women turning to dust, a guy crushed by steel girders, and some psychic surgery. Surgery is the only remotely gory thing in this film, and it's not gory enough to justify giving Beyond Evil anything more than a one barf bag rating. This is not a sick flick. Looking for a better possession film? Then be sure to check out my review of Beyond the Door. You'll find the link here on the screen. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.